And incidentally, it means that, ironically, the, the main use of zero, at least as we use it in our arithmetic, even though it's nothing, is to make numbers bigger. So, we in the West took rather a while to be impressed by such arithmetical jiggery-pokery. The, the Hindu numerals made their way eventually to Europe by way of Arabia in the early 13th century, thanks to the work of Leonardo of Pisa, better known as Fibonacci. But they didn't have an easy ride. In the year 1299, the, for example, the um, city authorities in Florence, Italy, banned the use of the Hindu-Arabic numerals with the placeholder zero at the center of their objections. Now, part of their objections were practical. It was the fact that the numerals 6, 9, and 0 in the new system were too easily confused compared with the very easily distinguishable numerals of the Roman system that was then prevalent. There was also the facility I've just discussed that you could vastly inflate the value of a number just by putting 0 at the end, which seemed an open invitation to fraud. Whether for that reason, or just because of the efficiency of dealing with numbers compared with the Roman system. I don't know if anyone's ever tried to do complex arithmetic in Roman numerals. It's impossible. You virtually have to have an abacus to do it with. But perhaps because of this efficiency, the ban that the Florentine authorities imposed didn't hold, at least in the commercial sphere. And soon, the Hindu-Arabic numerals with their placeholder zero were the common currency of business also in Europe. But zero in the number still faced profound philosophical and religious objections as the embodiment of the void. And it wasn't for another cen two centuries or more that this changed. And it changed with the cosmological revolution. That was, of course, Copernicus's, in the truest sense of the word, revolutionary insight that Earth moves around the sun rather than sun, the sun moves around the earth. And this finally began to liberate us from the shackles of the Aristotelian, of the Greek cosmology, with its abhorrence of the void. And the result, in very short order, was a scientific revolution. And a scientific revolution that had zero at its heart. In attempting to characterize the motions of the, of the celestial bodies, Isaac Newton devises his universal law of gravitation. But first, he has to devise or co-devise a mathematical tool to do it. And this tool is the calculus. And the calculus combines ideas of zero in the infinitesimally small to provide, for the first time, a cogent mathematical representation of motion and change. And it's this representation of zero that underlies all of mathematical science today. Zero, meanwhile, has impinged on almost every area of mathematics, including the Greeks' beloved geometry, with the Cartesian system of coordinates introduced by René Descartes, which provides an algebraic representation for every geometrical shape, which is embedded in a coordinate system at which zero, the origin, is at its heart. But perhaps the final triumph of zero comes in the late 19th century as set theory is developed as a new underpinning for number theory, and with it, all of mathematics. And within set theory, you can prove not only that zero is a legitimate mathematical quantity, but actually, you can construct all other numbers from zero, and therefore, in a very real sense, Zero is the only number that actually exists. <laughs> I, can't, I don't have time to get into that. There is an excellent essay by the mathematician Ian Stewart called Nothing in Common in the Nothing Book on page 158, I believe. Suffice to say, that it's, it's with this final victory of zero through the, the means of set theory that we come to the beginning of the talk again, and the fact that zero is a natural number. Like it or not, you better believe it. Thank you.